I'm at the Royal Perth Yacht Club and we're here today for a drug forum talk um, that's been organised by the Council for National Interest. There's a few key speakers here from medical academics to other people that have just been involved in this for many years and they're using their personal experience to help others in the community. The Council for the National Interest is involved with uh, the Family Council of WA and the Family Council of WA represents about 24 different action groups and they asked uh, the CNI people to put on a forum about drugs because the Family Council is most concerned with the, uh, the effect of drugs in our society. So uh, we uh, thought it was a worthwhile uh, endeavour. So we did a bit of research. I've spent nearly two months researching it and determining what sort of uh, forum we would put together. And uh, out of that came an arrangement where we got somebody from Drug Free Australia and uh, a local chap, um, Peter uh, Lyndon James from Shalom House. Um, he was invited along to give a practical side of rehabilitation. And then uh, Professor Stuart Rees from uh, Brisbane. Methamphetamines is ice, yeah. Yeah, ice, it's a, like a crystal meth. You smoke it or you can inject it, either or either. And both has the same effect. Personally, I believe that we have an epidemic on our hands, that people are smoking methamphetamines like they are cannabis, and but it's not the same. Even though you can smoke it the same, the effect's not the same. It's not as easy as just saying stop. I, I believe that the methamphetamines has a claw and it actually grabs a hold of you. And bit by bit, it systematically not only destroys the person, but it destroys the whole family unit. And we've only seen the beginning of something that's really, really bad. Something really, really big is coming and it's gonna stretch our resources to the limit. The drug's a really yummy drug. I've actually been sticking needles around for 26 years. Um, the sex, the conversations, the parties, 16 days, no sleep. Um, it's an exciting life and then all of a sudden to lay that down and just to be a geek, to be a normal person. I mean, it's boring being normal, but at least there's no consequences to be normal. It takes a lot to swap from one ship to another ship. Um, drugs actually uh, bring about a lifestyle that's really exciting and lots of fun. Um, I used to sell two and a half kilos of methamphetamines a day. Um, nowadays, uh, back when I stopped doing what I was doing, um, now they put the recipe online so every person anywhere and everyone can just download the recipe and start cooking. Um, so yes, most definitely there's an epidemic. Why wait until people uh, commit a crime and then look at compulsory treatment? Why not intercept people when an ICE user goes into the emergency department or gets hospitalised for some issue and you have to withdraw them for four days? Why not then look at having a pathway which allows that person to be uh, placed out in a residential facility where you can then continue to monitor them and have them then moving along. Why wait until they, they commit an offence? Because by the time they commit an offence, they'll be more engaged in that narcotic network. They're likely to have lost their non-drug using friends, they're likely to have lost family support, they're likely to, to uh, not have, it, have any other than drug using activities. And then what you've got to do if you want to get them out of there is resurrect all those activities again. And that's talking about a major costly system. So if we can identify them early while they're still living at home with mum and dad, while they're still perhaps going to school or have an employment, you know, while they've still got a family, while they've still got support systems, then you don't have to try and rebuild those things. I'm destroying mum and dad, brother and sister, and grandma and grandpa. It's literally desecrating family units, unforgiveness, bitterness, resentment, they're giving up on it, and it's just destroying the family as a whole. If you wait until people are involved in the criminal justice system, it already assumes that they've committed crimes. And if we're really going to be effective with this, we need to look at how we can intercept people prior to uh, them starting to get involved in criminal activities. So if we can identify those people, then we start to tackle the easy issues uh, and we get them better. And um, I think, uh, right, and then we can worry about some of the harder issues. So do the simple things to start off with that we're not doing, and then we can go back and look at some of the harder ones. Uh, well, I spent 26 years myself in institutions and prisons from the age of nine up until 31. And a lot of us don't want to be who we are, but we don't know how to change. And every time I did try to change, I tried to hang around the normal people and the geeks, the people who weren't doing um, what I was doing, but I felt like I was a weed that I didn't belong, so I went back to well, where I felt comfortable. Um, but the problem is where I felt comfortable, everyone was doing what I didn't want to do. And my whole life I just wanted to be normal, I just wanted to be a geek. Mum, dad, family holiday, one school. Um, but now I've found a way out. And so what I try to do is help others um, come out the same path um, where I've just taken. So we're, we're a holistic rehabilitation centre, so we literally do everything from the north, the south, the east and the west. Um, so we find the person, we find out what's in their heart, and we find out where all the relationships have been broken and splintered. Mum, dad, brother, sister, grandma, grandpa. 
And we also look after all their finances, and Baycourt, Vita Files, Bad Debt, Centrelink, Driver's Licence. And we also look after all unfinished business. They might have had a car dumped on the side of the road or uh, things that they haven't uh, taken back, they borrowed some time, or things in hock, we clean up all them. And we also ask them, hey, what do you want to do with your life? Whether it's a boilermaker, or a tiler, or a painter, start a business, apprenticeship, um, we do everything north, south, east and west. So when, when they leave our facility, they leave whole, full and complete, um, with nothing holding them back to the best of our ability. By the time the pol politicians are starting to respond, it's because the community is putting pressure on them and by that stage the horse has already bolted. So we really need to be a bit more proactive and you look at some of the science which is out there at the moment and some common sense and start to do that before uh, before it obviously becomes paramount as a political issue to do. But, you know, things are often, but not, that's living in a fantasy world. You know, we're simply going to be in a, in a, continue in a situation where politicians act because it's a political imperative they need to so they can do a showpiece to demonstrate how good they are. And if the community doesn't see that as being a big issue at the time, then they're wasting their time. It's just one of the unfortunate traits of the way things go around. But most people can't actually see that until they hit the wall, until they lost everything. It's like people who can wake up in the morning next to mum and dad or they see their children running up the hallway, we take it for granted until we haven't got it. It's a gift to wake up next to your wife. It's a gift to and go to the park with your children. It's a gift. And we actually live for the now. We live for what makes us feel good and what fixes our problems for today. And no, 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 that's not good. That's just really, really bad. People are hedonistic. If they find something which is uh, cheap enough and uh, gives them a, a um, high, then, uh, and they can do that without impunity, uh, perhaps once a month, then if you can do it once a month, why not uh, once a week? And if you can do it once a week, why not twice a week? And if you can do it twice a week, why not every day? And so it goes on and on. And so, uh, yeah, that's, um, that's just the nature of people. And it's really an issue of identifying when that starts to go pear-shaped, getting hold of people and shifting them out of that and getting them back on a new course and action rather than waiting until they're entrenched in some network and then try and dig them out. I think they need to be honest with themselves that they're too scared to bring it out in the light because they're scared of the consequences. But as long as it's in the dark, they're in a prison. But when you stick a pick in your arm or smoke a pipe or pop a pill, it's like getting on the train. And on the train, it's lots and lots of fun. But what happens is the train that starts picking up speed it gets faster and faster and faster until one day you look up and everyone's jumped off. The conductors are down, the windows are shut, the doors are locked and the only way you get off the train is when you hit the brick wall. And it always ends in a big finale. You're either in debt, you've lost your wife, you've lost your children, you've lost your home um, or you're in jail. You're at the bottom of the bottom of the bottom, you lost everything. It's really hard to get off that train. But the best way to get off the train is to tell the truth. Tell someone you're struggling. Speak up before it's too late. Well, uh, we're very concerned that the risks associated with cannab cannabis use uh, are not being shared with the Australian people. Um, many, most of those risks are widely acknowledged in the specialist community, so it is frustrating for us that people are not more familiar with it in, in the ordinary community. So we think we would like to see more education about the risks that the community is being placed at with this strong push now for increasing access to cannabis and indeed other, other drugs that are presently not lawful. This is in relation to basically making cannabis legal now. Um, you're saying raising the awareness. In, in what ways? Uh, well, well, I'm certainly not advocating that we make cannabis legal. Well, well, some of the risks are talked about from time to time amongst doctors and researchers. Uh, the, the lung risks, the brain risks, the psychiatric risks, the driving risks, uh, the, the gateway stuff, uh, the fact that it leads to other addictions, and the, the fact that people who become addicted to cannabis fail at major life tasks, so they can't hold a job, they can't maintain steady relationships, uh, they become welfare dependent long term. Those things are talked about. The, uh, the genotoxicity, the damage to DNA, the damage to the genes uh, in the person who uses it and in their children, uh, the research is indicating for, for three and four generations at least, maybe, maybe a lot more. So you're talking about the next hundred years of Australia's community life and doing long term damage to genes, some of, it, some of which may not actually be repairable. I think there's also out there some people who are legitimately interested in problem solving and it's an issue of identifying who those people are and looking at how we fit the systems together. I think one of the difficulties with dealing with alcohol and drugs in Western Australia is that 
certainly as you move more remote, 50% of the services are funded by the Commonwealth, 50% by the state. Even they don't talk to each other. Even within the state services, one department won't, one set of bureaucrats won't talk to another set of bureaucrats. You won't get the Mental Health Commission, which used to be the drug, part of the Drug and Alcohol Office, so you won't get the people who are responsible for drug and alcohol talking to liquor licensing because it's in a different part of the system. And of course you wouldn't want to criticise another bureaucrat, would you? And so um, we can't even talk within our own systems and then we have a funding model. We already know that if you're going to shift people out from point A to point B, out of drug use back into the community, you're going to require, what are we going to require? Health, housing, education, training, employment. So all those sort of issues. Now, we're talking about four different departments that actually have to talk to each other and, and link together. And the big impediment is that nobody funds the person that's going to link those components together and so it's not happening. What we do is we have housing for Aboriginal people and non-Aboriginal people who might be substance users, but gee, do they talk to the health people who are dealing with those people at the same time? Do they deal with the hospitals? So it's about linking the services together more effectively. And that we need to look more at how we do simple linkages which don't require big committees to be put together and big resources uh, in order to be able to do that. So, you know, I, I, everyone knows what the issue is. A lot of people know what the issue is. You go and talk to people up north and they say, we'd love to do this, but it's not within our funding mandate. We would love to work more in relation to uh, getting people out of hospital with, who have serious alcohol and drug issues and put them into a culturally appropriate residential facility under the care of the AMS. But you know, we're not funded to provide the person who would allow that transfer through there. We'll be going to break now for Perth City Talks, but stay tuned and stay with us when we come back.